The energy of a molecule depends on the position of its atoms. In this model of ethane that's shown here, the staggered conformation is more favorable or more stable than the eclipsed conformation that's seen here. So the positions of atoms in a molecule define a structure. Let's call it structure A. And associated with those positions are a particular energy value or an energy state, which we're going to represent as a solid line on an energy diagram. If we were to deform the position of those atoms in unfavorable ways, we would be raising the energy. We would be making the molecule more unstable. We would decrease its stability. This is analogous to a ball on a platform where we increased the height of that ball. In other words, we've increased its potential energy. We've made it less stable. The energy of a single structure isn't very meaningful to us until we know what alternatives exist for that molecule. Are those alternatives more or less favorable based on energy? It's not much different than the ball on a platform. Until we know where the position of the ground is and have a reference point, we really don't know what the energy difference between a position Y is and its final resting point when it's on the ground. And so what we really want to know for molecules is where does the energy of that structure A compare to some alternative form, say the energy of structure B? Knowing the energy difference, we know how much more or less stable structure A is compared to that of B. In this particular case, we can see that B is more favorable than A. It's lower in energy, and so when we take the difference in energy, we're going to get a negative delta E. That means that A transforms into B in a favorable way. So here's a plot of energy versus dihedral angle or torsional angle for the molecule bromoethane. And we're going to define a dihedral angle of zero degrees as being this eclipsed conformation shown here. Associated with that eclipsed conformation is an energy state. Now, if we allow this molecule to undergo torsion rotation, where the bromine in the back is rotated by 60 degrees, we enter into the staggered conformation that's shown here, and associated with that staggered conformation is a new energy, a lower energy, meaning the staggered conformation is more favorable relative to the eclipsed conformation. If we continue to rotate that bromine by another 60 degrees, we're again into a eclipsed conformational state with that high energy position. Now, if we continue the process, every 60 degrees, we go from eclipsed to staggered to eclipsed to staggered to eclipsed and back to the original position where the bromine is on top of this hydrogen just as it was initially. We've rotated a full 360 degrees about that carbon-carbon bond. We can see that on this diagram, by connecting the energy states together with lines like this, then we have energy minima, which are known as the stable states, for all of these staggered conformations, whereas we have energy maxima, which are known as barriers, for those eclipsed forms. So how long does it take bromoethane to travel from one staggered form to another? On our energy diagram, it's like going from one energy valley over a barrier height to another. And the important question about how long does it take depends on one parameter, and that parameter is the barrier height, or delta G double dagger. We could quantify this in terms of a half-life, tall one half, the time it takes for 50% of the molecule to change from one form to another, and that's related to a rate constant. Now don't worry about the math here, but that rate constant is related to things that we care about, like temperature or that barrier height. And so if we were to plug in some numbers, we could see just how long it takes the process to go depending upon what the barrier height is. So the values in this table were calculated with the equation. You don't need to worry about doing that calculation or even worry about memorizing these values, but they are here to give you some feeling for a process that takes place at room temperature, what different barrier heights might mean. Now room temperature means that's the amount of thermal energy we've imparted into the molecule in order to overcome that barrier. And we're going to express that barrier in terms of height represented by kilocalories per mole. A height of 5 kilocalories per mole is crossed very rapidly. 
one, the resonance time in a valley is on the order of nanoseconds, or 1 times 10 to the minus 9th seconds. In contrast, if we increase that number up to 30 kilocalories per mole, the resonance time is on the order of years, a very slow process. We've gone from an exceedingly fast to an exceedingly slow process by changing the barrier height from 5 to 30 kilocalories per mole. And so you can see that a process that's got a 20 kilocalorie per mole barrier height at room temperature is a, a process that's going to take place on the order of seconds, on a time frame that we can associate with. This was an important webcast where we were able to associate structure to energy and energy to a rate of change. We use these ideas throughout the entire semester in describing the reactivity of organic molecules.